So you'll, you'll all have to forgive me for being somewhat uh, subdued. I got a call <clears throat> early this morning from Joan McNabb who said, Jeff, you got to wake up, get to the airport, and come down to Los Angeles and speak <laughs> at the Mobile Privacy Summit. I said, Joan, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. What are you talking about? She said, Jeff, <clears throat> The Attorney General was supposed to speak here today, and she's not able to do that. So you've got to come down here and speak on her behalf. So I had the same question. I said, Joan, why me? And she said, well, Jeff, you are the Special Assistant Attorney General. You are the Attorney General's Principal Policy Advisor for Technology Issues, and this is your job. <laughs> and that seemed pretty persuasive, so here I am. She did warn me that in addition to speaking to a room full of people who are going to be expecting Kamala Harris, the Attorney General of California, instead of me, I was also going to be the last speaker, and therefore the only thing standing between you and a good stiff drink. But what she didn't tell me, and which I didn't know, is that I'd be speaking after Nico and Gilman, two of the most exciting, exciting speakers I've listened to in a long time, so it's a tough road to hoe. But in any event, here I am, and on behalf of the California Attorney General, I want to thank all of you for participating in what was clearly a very exciting event. I want to thank our sponsor, Intuit, all of our sponsors, uh, the panelists. <laughs> our panelists and the companies they represent. Uh, and thank you to our host, uh, ROC uh, Santa Monica. Um, you know, Sitting here today and listening to the speakers, I was struck by really how exciting a topic this is, how exciting it is to be involved in these kinds of conversations. We all are involved in a technological revolution, and California and Silicon Beach is at the very center of that revolution. Digital technology and the internet empowers us in a way that many of us could never have imagined just even just a decade ago. And mobile app technology, mobile apps that all of you help build, puts this technology in our pockets. It allows us to take it with us wherever we go. We now have more access to information than we ever had before, than anyone has ever had before. We have more of an ability to reach out and connect with untold numbers of people than ever before. We can share our ideas and our thoughts and our lives and our passions in a way that is truly extraordinary. Especially to those of us who have lived in a life before, in a time before the internet, before GPS technology, before cellular technology, a time that my children refer to as the dark ages, Right? To those of us who have experienced that life, what we're talking about now is truly remarkable and exciting. And I don't know about you, but I am constantly shocked at the magnitude of the, the, the innovation and the ideas that you hear talked about. So sitting here, and I'll keep my comments very brief because I, I know we're at the end of a long day, but one of the things I would ask everyone to think about is to explore a little bit more what it is we are involved in, the endeavor that we approach here. I think that what everyone here in this room is doing is changing the world. Mobile technology is changing the world in a profound way. And so I ask each and every one of you, how are you going to change the world? And this is really just sort of a, a variation of what Nico and Gilman were saying to you. But I want to build on that and, and build on what they were saying. Change, especially profound change, sometimes comes at a cost. And I think all of us have an obligation to be cautious and careful that the change we make doesn't undermine core values. It doesn't change who we are in too profound a way. One of the core values, of course, that we're talking about is privacy. 
privacy is a core value. I think everybody here acknowledges that. And it's not lost on any of us, especially the lawyers in the room, that California is not only the place, sort of the ground zero of innovation and di digital technology, but is also a state that has enshrined privacy in its constitution. It is a core legal value in California and in the United States. We heard some conversation earlier when the, um, the uh, platform panel was speaking about privacy, and I wanted to speak about that a little bit more because they were talking about privacy in terms of uh, data hygiene and security. But privacy as a legal concept and as a moral concept can be thought of differently. There are at least three components to privacy that I think everybody should have in their mind. There's, of course, physical privacy, which probably comes to people first as, a, as an idea. There's also informational privacy, which is also something we've talked about. And then there's decisional privacy, which at least courts tend to talk of in the context of reproductive rights and uh, living and dying issues like that. All of this combines to, to, in, into a concept that Justice Brandeis once called the right to be let alone. And that's really, at the end of the day, what we're all talking about here today when we talk about privacy. So my question that I'd like everybody to think about you know, when you leave here today and when you think about what all the panelists have spoken of is what does privacy look like in a fully networked world, in a world where the Internet of Things is not just around the corner, it's here? What does it look like? Can I attend an alcohol anonymous meeting anonymously? Can I see my psychiatrist without fear that everybody will find out and I'll be stigmatized? Can I visit my mosque? Can I research medical conditions while maintaining my privacy? Can I read literature issued by a fringe political organization? Can you all develop apps that are exciting and dynamic and make money while preserving that kind of privacy? That's what we're talking about. That's what's at stake. I don't think that we have to choose between privacy and innovation. And in fact, I think California is proving that we can have both. The Attorney General speaks about this all the time and firmly believes that we should avoid false choices. We can have our privacy and we can support innovation at the same time. And California is doing that. We uh, have some of the toughest privacy laws on the books in the country, if not the toughest, and we're also a center of innovation. Let me, let me just wrap up with three final points that I think are takeaways. I know there are a lot of lawyers in the room, but to those of you who are not lawyers, at least some of what was presented today may seem like a very complex quilt of federal and state legislation, or even international legislation, that presents uh, a, a tough challenge for lay people to navigate. But I agree with what I heard Gilman saying before, that common sense and decency are a pretty good, pretty good way to, uh, to, to navigate through this. I think, there's, I think you can boil that down to three principles that if you follow will, uh, will, will, will keep you out of trouble. First of all, be honest with your customers. This should be, the, all of these principles, by the way, should be baked into the DNA of the technology you're responsible for. Be honest with your customers. Tell them what you're doing with their data. Have a privacy policy that clearly and accurately describes the data you collect and what you do with it and with whom you share it. Don't be greedy. Don't over-collect data. If you don't need it, don't collect it. And I think, again, you've heard reasons why there, there's you know, exposure to risk, but it's also the right, the right way to, to, to build your business. And finally, I would submit to you that a third principle to incorporate in your business model is, is uh, respect. Be respectful of consumers' autonomy. Give them a choice 
where possible about what to share and how to share it. So I think, I think those three principles, if you build them into your technology, will serve you well. Those are, those are the only comments that I had um, prepared. I'm happy to also answer any questions about the, um, the Attorney General's office, but I'm also very happy to let you go and enjoy uh, cocktail hour. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask one question, and then I'll, I'll help you maestro others. Um, what if, so the Attorney General has taken, obviously, a strong position in California. California has taken a strong position in privacy law. Other states have or haven't followed. How do you sort of, how does that fit? Right? A lot of things the California Letter on Environmental Laws, the United States government, and a lot of federal laws followed. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting role for a state attorney general. It's a fairly assertive role. Um, how does that fit in the context of, of what's going on globally? How does it fix, fit, you know, politically as you sit around and think about why are we doing this? How are we doing this? Are we really just focused on California? How do we? play in this, in this very large leadership role in what is really a global environment for the companies in California as well as the companies here? Sure. Um, well, the, 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 that's a sort of multi-layer question, but um, first of all, the Attorney General works very closely with her colleagues, um, the other Attorneys General. We're involved in the National Association of Attorneys General, or NAG, as it's called, <laughs> affectionately. Um, and there's also the, that's right, there's, there's, other, there's other names for it as well. But, but, um, but um, absolutely, I mean, look, you know, California is the largest state in the country. Um, we are, I think, the ninth largest economy in the world. And moreover, um, the Attorney General feels very strongly that at least part of her role is to um, promote and protect the innovative companies that are in her backyard. She's truly very proud of being... Uh, a daughter of California and the Attorney General of the state where so much of the innovation is taking place. She also recognizes that to the extent that start states are starting to develop their own privacy frameworks, this represents to at least to some extent regulatory risk for innovative companies and especially companies that don't necessarily have the resources to hire a fancy general counsel who can keep up with the uh, rules of all the different jurisdictions. And then you add on top of this sort of the international framework, and it becomes even more challenging. So while on the one hand, we're very proud of being a leader in the, in the field of privacy, on the other hand, um, we, we are um, closely working with other states to harmonize the framework. So you set the rules and they should just follow along. It's how they see that, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I, don't, I, I certainly don't see it that way. Uh, Jim Halpert. Sure. Uh, I appreciate everything you said, Jeff. It's terrific. Uh, California is a leader and uh, continues to work on privacy laws to address gaps and holes out there. A potential problem is when other states pick up on what California has done and decide to do something different. That creates conflicts around the United States. It can violate the Dormant Commerce Clause, so maybe it's not even enforceable. Uh, but it, it also makes the technology industry less enthusiastic about working on Cal with, with the California AG's office on a whole lot of new laws. Which generally, I, I represent a lot of the technology companies that follow this and had a great experience working with Joan and others uh, on things that I think really protect California's privacy. But I constantly hear this concern, uh, I'm almost getting out a little ahead of some of the members of the, of the organization, that uh, some state's going to come along and do something different. I'll give you an example. The eraser button uh, bill that, that uh, Senator Steinberg introduced um, you know, the, that was not one that, that, that came from the AG's office, but now um, in Maryland, it's got an email, uh, a bunch of, of advocates want to take that right and extend it so that anybody can request a takedown of any information relating to a child, even if they're not the author of it, they could be censoring the child, a whole bunch of different 
problems flow from that. It would be tremendous if in working with other state AGs, because this is a proposal coming out of the Maryland AG's office uh, task force, you guys would, would embrace the process of harmonization, speaking directly to them, saying we've got a solution in California, here's how it works, it's important that this be uniform. I know you mentioned you were having those discussions, but I can tell you that every idea that comes through the California legislature, somebody wants to change it in two or three other states and it becomes a, a mess. So yeah. if, if you would be able to help with that, it would be really terrific. Well, look, I hear this a lot. I mean, I, I think you make an excellent point, although, of course, as I think you recognize, the bill you mentioned was not sponsored by the Attorney General. But, but, <laughs> right, but, 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 but to your point, I mean, listen, you know, I, I get it. I hear this a lot. I understand that um, businesses are greatly challenged by our laboratories of democracy, right? So, so um, there is value in clarity, in standardization, and um, risk minimization. On the other hand, of course, that's not traditionally how the legislative process has worked. But look, I'll take it one step forward. One of the things that the Attorney General firmly believes is that we as regulators have to innovate. We have to innovate the way we regulate the technology sector, in part because of some of the things that was mentioned earlier. By the time you get a bill passed into law, it, it's obsolete half the time. And that's true with litigation as well. The way most traditional regulators have approached their job is to use their subpoena power, their power to investigate, their power to prosecute civil and criminal cases, and their power to influence legislation. That is sort of the old model, and, and, and appropriate in some instances. But when it comes to the technology sector, one of the things that the Attorney General has, has taken a lead on and executed, I think, fairly well, is the idea of public-private partnership what I think someone else referred to as co-regulation, partnering with the private sector so that we don't have to go to that old school format. And I think that's something that um, we have done fairly well, that the Attorney General has executed on, and I think in that sense, we're showing leadership as well. California has long been in a position where we educate um, foreign students and often it's complained that they take away positions in the university systems from our own students. But should we perhaps, from the ethical standpoint, should we perhaps look at it as a, as a slight advantage that some of these students are being educated and grad students with the met law standards that you're mentioning here in California? Well, education policy is a little bit beyond the scope of my expertise, and it sounds like in as sure, sure. No, I mean, look, you know, I think I think that um, uh, is a thoughtful question, and I think the question itself points out the global nature of the issues we're discussing. The things that we do, it, do here in the United States have a ripple effect across the entire world. And the things that we do in pri with privacy in California have a ripple effect across the entire world. Um, I, I think your point is well taken, that students who are educated here in the United States take the lessons we give them and bring them back home, which I would submit would be a good thing.